Today we'll be we will be reading from James chapter 5 verses 19 through 20. My brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of God. Thank you, Mackenzie. Good morning. There's a line at the end of uh, the Lord of the Rings, the story of Lord of the Rings, and in the third book, The Return of the King, where Sam, upon being reunited with Gandalf the wizard, who he presumed to be dead, says this, Gandalf, I thought you were dead, but then I thought I was dead myself. Is everything sad going to come untrue? What is happening to the world? Is everything sad going to come untrue? That's kind of what Easter is about. As the great eagle proclaims as he's soaring over the peoples of Minas Tirith. You guys know the song? He announces the defeat of King Sauron. Where are my Lord of the Rings fans at? Sing now, ye people of Anor. You guys know the, the poem? Sing with me. Here we go. Ready? (laughs) Sing now, you people of the Tower of Anor, for the realm of Sauron is ended forever, and the dark tower is thrown down. Sing and rejoice, ye people of the Tower of Guard, for your watch hath not been in vain, and the black gate is broken, and your king hath passed through, and he is victorious. Sing and be glad, all ye children of the West, for your king shall come again, and he shall dwell among you all the days of your life. And the tree that was withered shall be renewed, and he shall plant it in the high places, and the city shall be blessed. Sing, all ye people. That captured the heart of Easter. Of course, I love Lord of the Rings. Any chance I get to put in the Lord of the Rings illustration? On Easter, Christians celebrate death is not the end, that our king has been victorious at the black gate. He has broken through the tower of Sauron, of evil has been thrown down. Christians celebrate the world that is, the world that we know it, the, what's dark and depressed, depressing, and what's broken and abusive, what is stress and anxiety inducing, is, is not eternal. It's temporary. One day, like Jesus, all who put their faith in him will be raised and resurrected with him. Amen. That is what Easter is about. Right. Jesus resurrected, you put your faith in Jesus, you're going to be resurrected too regardless of the back pain and the loss and the suffering and the acne and the relational discord, one day we will be glorified and see Jesus face to face and walk with him. As he was raised, we too will be raised. That's what we believe as Christians. We will be raised to live in a resurrected age in the world that is to come where there will be no more death, No more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. The old things, the things of this world are going to pass away and Jesus is going to make all things new. As historian and New Testament scholar N.T. Wright says, he says it so beautifully, I just wanted to quote, quote him. Easter was when hope in person surprised the whole world by coming forward from the future into the present. Easter is when hope in person surprised the whole world by coming forward from the future into the present. He goes on to to say in his book, Who Was Jesus? It will not do, therefore, to say that Jesus' disciples invented the idea of resurrection as a way of coping with a cruelly broken death. That was an initial apparent psychological plausibility, but it didn't work as serious first century history. We know lots of other messianic and similar movements in the Jewish world roughly contemporary with Jesus. In many cases, the leader died a violent death at the hands of authorities. In not one single case do we hear the slightest mention of the disappointed followers claiming that their hero has been raised from the dead. They knew better. Resurrection was not a private event. Claiming that the original leader was alive again was simply not an option. Unless, he says, of course, it was. And he was. Pastor and author Tim Keller says, Christianity isn't true because it's relevant. 
It's relevant because it's true. What we believe as Christians is based, and what we celebrate on Easter is not based on, oh, th- this, wouldn't it feel good if this was true? Wouldn't that be nice? Like, I became a Christian not primarily because I thought it'd be nice to believe in. I became a Christian be- not because I was looking forward to the, the potential misrepresentation, ascribing to a worldview that many think, think is narrow, hateful, oppressive, bigoted even. I didn't become a pastor because I thought Christianity gave me a good feeling <laughs> that I wanted to just share with others. I didn't willingly take on the stress and anxiety of serving in pastoral ministry because I thought it was a good career move. <laughs> I've given my life to Jesus. I have responded to the call of pastoral ministry because I believe what happened, what we celebrate today on Easter Sunday, actually happened. It's real. It was an actual historic event, and it changes everything. I believe it. I believe it's true. I've given my life to it, and I want to share that truth with others, and I want to share that truth with you. I'm convinced that Jesus lived and died and rose again. The historic gospel is true. It's compelling. It's convincing, and I want to share that with you this morning. Is that okay? Happy Easter. <laughs> the resurrection of Jesus, what we celebrate in Easter, is, is it's like the, the lone block on the, in a Jenga tower. You know that moment when you get to the end, towards the end of playing Jenga, and there's typically like two pieces on the bottom that have been taken away, and there's just one last piece there that's kind of teetering, the whole tower's teetering on this. The resurrection in the Christian faith is like if you tried to move that Jenga piece out, everything's coming down. You take away the resurrection of Jesus... Christians just have a lame hobby. (laughs) What are we doing? We're singing to a dead guy. And he wasn't just a fake. Like, he said he was going to do this and he didn't do this. He's not trustworthy, but he's a liar. (laughs) And then we're idiots (laughs) for believing it. (laughs) (laughs) There's no resurrection. We worship a fake. We follow a liar. We're wasting our lives as we read and study the Bible. We're wasting our lives giving up our, our Sunday morning in this beautiful day in the Northwest, these, these three months that we have of nice weather, <laughs> to be inside. One of the proofs that Jesus really rose from the dead is, as we've seen through our study of the book of James, we've been studying through the book of James these last 13 weeks together. The book of James is believed to be written by the, the brother, the half-brother of Jesus. Right? They had the same mother, but different father. And James calls Jesus Lord and Christ. He describes himself as, quote, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have a brother named Micah. And if Micah told me one day, "Uh, Daniel, call me Lord Micah Christ. (laughs) Micah, call me, or Daniel, call me uh, Micah Messiah, (laughs) anointed one. I would be one of the first to say, dude, I grew up with you, right? You're not a Messiah. <laughs> I know your sins. I know how imperfect you are. And there have been people who have been claimed to, to be divine, to claim to be the Messiah. But all, of, all that happens when they, when they die, it fizzles out. And here is James, the brother of the, Jesus, giving, leading in the Christian faith, leading the church of Jerusalem, writing books, giving his life, And this is what the followers of Jesus did. They they gave it all. They died following Jesus. It changed, literally changed the day that they used to worship. They would gather together on Saturdays, on the Sabbath, to worship. And these Jewish guys became Christians. They they changed the day that they worshiped on, Sunday, in 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 symbolism and to glorify Jesus. Was raised on Sunday morning, the Lord's Day, it's called. Jesus, the half brother of, of James, the half-brother of Jesus, became a leader of the church. More importantly, he gave his life for his brother, who he called his Lord, servant, Christ. And he wrote this letter, this book, because he believed he knew that Jesus really was who he said he was. He is Lord. He's Christ. He's Messiah. He is the Son of God. And he knew that you can't claim to believe in this Jesus and, and live the same as when you didn't believe him. In other words, you believe in Jesus and it does something. It's transformative. It's powerful. It's, it's radical. It's life-changing. Right? If, you, if you see an apple tree 
you can pretty safely deduce that what made that apple tree was an apple seed, right? I don't know much about gardening and, and trees. I know enough to know that the fruit reveals the seed. For James, you can't, have, you can't claim to have true living seed of faith and not have that faith produce fruit of Christ-like character and good works and deeds and, and love. James wants his readers to have a faith that is not inconsistent. We don't say one thing and we do another. He wants us to have a faith that is whole, that's complete, where it's wholehearted trust and devotion to Jesus. So we've taken the last 12 weeks to look through the book of James at this wisdom for wholeness. And we we talked about how we think chapter one might be a summary. It introduces the main ideas of the book. And then we've seen 12 or 11 now, 12 if you can count today, 12 different wisdom sayings about uh, of James on wisdom. So we've seen that favoritism and love don't go together. You, you can't have faith in Christ and show partiality. You can't show favoritism. He said you can't have genuine faith and have no works. Faith without works is dead. It doesn't, that, a, a dead, dead faith shows itself in no works, not transformed life. We saw how faith and wisdom is to infect, affect our tongues <laughs> and how we speak. We saw how that there's true wisdom and how that is compared to and contrasted against false wisdom. True wisdom is pure and gentle and peaceable and sincere and impartial. False wisdom leads to all kinds of disorder and every vile practice. We saw how Christians are to have a, a wholly devoted heart to Jesus and how oftentimes our hearts are divided. So <laughs> he asks us, hey, what causes quarrels and fights from among you? And, and we might say, they do. Those difficult people in my life, they cause fights and quarrels among you. And James says, Right. Yeah. Come on, guys. It's in the heart. He says you can't condemn others. He talks about he compares our plans versus God's plans and says we can't live as though there's no reference to God or in submission to God. And we say, yeah, I'll, I'm going to go over to Kent and I'll, I'll go down to Tacoma and I'll go over here and I'll make such and such a prophet and I'll do this in a year or so. He says all such boasting is arrogant. So you have to live in submission. That's what wisdom means. Live in submission to the providence of God. So you say things like, if the Lord wills, I'm going to do this, right? And that doesn't mean we have to be really annoying about that. Like every time someone asks us to make plans, I, I like to be annoying because I'm an older brother. But that doesn't mean you have to do that. <laughs> he talked about the danger of riches in James 5, 1 through 6. He, he talked about how we were to have patience in suffering because suffering is a, a way that God uses to refine our faith and draw us closer to him. He talks about how we were to, to tell the truth. Right? Carrie preached... A sermon on one verse, James 5, 12, on the importance of telling the truth. Let your yes mean yes and your no mean no. And last week we looked at prayer and how prayer is effective and powerful and the prayer of a righteous is availeth much. You remember that? And this morning we're concluding our study through the book of James. And I think fittingly and providentially looking at restoring others. That's what the passage is all about this morning on Resurrection Sunday. So it's about restoring those who have wandered and uh, the restoration of those who have gone astray. And this morning we're looking at a verse that's one sentence. Uh, it's two verses in our, in our English Bibles of the book. It says, J- my, James 5, 19 through 20, starts this way. My brothers, which we've talked about similar to Latin languages, he says brothers confer to both men and women, so brothers and sisters. If anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. And that's the end. That's the end of the book. Now you read other letters of Paul, and and Paul has different things to say at the end of his letters. He says, you know, greet such and such here and such and such there. Greet all those who are in Caesar's household. I, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. Grace and peace to you. This is what he says. There's none of this in in the end of James. There's no greet one another. There's no peace to you. There's no, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. There's no, I, James, write this with my own hand. There's no, all the saints in Jerusalem greet you. There's no, here's from such and such and be sure to thank them and that's it. Let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. It's like very abrupt, isn't it? Nothing else, James? That's all you got? Not even a, sincerely, James. (laughs) James. <laughs> what does he end with? It's a call to action. 
And that's fitting, I think, as the whole book has been a call to action. There are more imperative verbs, more command verbs in James per sentence than any other book in the New Testament. James has been all about action. So how does he end his book? A call to action. He's basically saying what I've been trying to do in this book to you, bringing you back to the truth, you go do to others. Inevitably, any true Christian, as Robert Plummer says, any true Christian reading James' letter will experience conviction of sin and desire for confession, repentance, and restoration. I think we've experienced that as a church as we've gone through James. It's been convicting. Readers will also be reminded of those formerly within the Christian community who have strayed from the fold. And James ends his letter with a loving exhortation not to neglect the straying sinner, but to seek him out with love and truth. Underlying James' exhortation is a biblical understanding of perseverance. To wander from the truth, never to return, proves that one truly never belonged to God. One that one of the means God has instituted to preserve his people is the loving, loving brotherly, and sisterly concern Christians are to show for one another. As the wandering person is brought back to repentance, the death and sins referred to in James 5.20 most naturally refer to his sins that are now forgiven, and his former visible trajectory toward death has been arrested by the grace of God. Only God knows who is truly his, so a member of the Christian community begins to live as an unbeliever. The only right thing to do is to warn that person from all appearances. He is running towards eternal death, and that very warning may be the instrument God uses to preserve his salvation. So many, many think that what James is referring to is the wandering of a believer away. So go after that believer. Seek after that believer. Call that believer back to the truth. And notice, in my Bible at least, there's no little note. There's no little asterisk that says, this is only for pastors. Like pastors are really only responsible to go after people, to seek them out, to seek their restoration. It's only for church leaders. This kind of goes against, I think, what we can experience and, and, and we've seen in our current society of many people's views of the church. I don't need others. I don't need the church. It's just me and Jesus. And James is saying, you're supposed to look out for each other. Look out for those in the Christian community to pursue others, to go after those who have gone astray. There's not to be stray cats in the church, in other words. I don't know if this illustration is going to land very well, but I thought about it this morning. We used to have a stray cat in our neighborhood. An orange tabby would wander into our yard. And as we moved into the neighborhood, our neighbors told us, yeah, we don't really know whose cat that is, but it kind of just wanders around the neighborhood and it, it's fine. And no one was claiming the cat. The, the neighborhood co- was kind of content with no one really owning it, kind of just wandering around. And I thought about this, this kind of dynamic is not supposed to mark the church. This, oh, yeah, they're kind of wandering through our neighborhood. But they don't really belong here. They don't really belong there, but... They're around, you know? Can you guys relate to what I'm saying? They're kind of just floating. When it comes to life in, in, the, in Christian community, we are called not to be like racehorses, with these blinders that are put on our eyes to kind of guard the periphery. And all it is is like, just looking ahead. Let me just get to that race slide. It doesn't, doesn't matter, the people next to me. I'm just focused on, on am I winning? I think the Christian faith is more so to be like daycare workers. <laughs> and, and one of my favorite coffee shops in the neighborhood is at Empire Coffee. And as I'm sitting there working, sometimes I'll see there's a, a, a daycare nearby. And at, from time to time, the daycare workers will lead the kids to like up to Mar Vista Park on an outing. And it, it's funny, they have this long rope with, <laughs> with knots on it that the kids are to hold on to. And there's a worker at the front, there's a worker at the back, and there's one that kind of walks alongside them, kind of making sure no kid gets left behind. We're all kind of moving together. Like this is, this is the image that I have in mind in regards to Christian faith. It's not like, I don't care about anyone else. I'm just getting there. It's, hey, you doing okay? Hey, come on, let's go. Why are you slacking behind? Come on. Don't let go of the rope, right? Does that make sense? Let's make sure we're going together. No one running away. No one's getting lost. This is the call I, of James, I think, to us. We're to go after those who have wandered, those who have strayed, those who have... Uh, turned. It says, turning back a sinner from the error of his way. We're supposed to restore those who have wandered. This calls for the followers of Jesus to be diligent, to be vil- vigilant. Vi- not vigilant. Well, vigilant kind of does work too. 
But vigilant, yes. Like a village, like characterized like a village. That, I just came up with that word. Villigent. For James, someone who has wandered from the truth is not someone, he says, those who have wandered from the truth, in other words, he's talking about their lifestyle doesn't match the truth. Because for James, you can't just say that you believe in the truth and live like before. It's, he's talking about wandering from the truth, meaning your behavior, your character, your lifestyle is out of step with alignment to the truth of, of God's word. It's showing that you are not believing through your actions. It's straying into wayward patterns of thinking and living and loving and behaving. And inevitably, in, in the life of the church and the community, there's going to be those who will get discouraged. Those who will wander. Those who will have a hard time believing. Those who will want to pull away. Those who will want to isolate. Those who will be tested and fail and struggle with the shame of that failure. And some, I think, we could say, well, maybe they, they never really had true faith. But we can't really say that. Right. Others might have true belief that have just wandered and, and fallen away. And the call is to go, to go after them. He says, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. James is most likely describing the one here who restores the brother or sister as saving them from a kind of spiritual death. James has described what happens when, when sin is fully produced, what, it, what fruit it bears. Earlier in the book he wrote in James, in James 1, 14 and 15, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then that desire, when it has conceived, it gives birth to death, sin, and when sin, it is fully grown, brings forth death. So what, this is what James has in mind. This is where he knows sin, unrepentant sin, this is where it, this is where it leads. Death. But he says those who bring someone back will cover a multitude of sins. And that's not saying that we, have some, we are somehow able to forgive sins as, as brothers and sisters, but that God would use us as instruments right. and agents of reconciliation. He's talking about the one who goes after the wayward believer will bring forgiveness from God or they'll experience forgiveness from God through their bringing them back. When the one is brought back, when they're restored, they return from the error of their way. James is saying they receive forgiveness. That's what covered a multitude of sins means. I like the way Charles Spurgeon wrote about this passage. He said, In the days of James, if any erred from the truth and from holiness, there were believers who sought their recovery and, those, and whose joy it was to save their soul from death. He who has erred was one of us. He who sat with us at the communion table, he has been deceived by the subtlety of Satan. Let us not judge him harshly. He says, above all, let us not leave him to perish without pity. If he were a saved man, he is still our brother, and he should be, it should be the, our business to bring back the prodigal and make our father's heart glad. If he is not a child of God, if his profession was a mistake or pretense, grieve over him all the more, for his doom must be more terrible. Still seek his conversion." Spurgeon is calling from this passage that regardless of their heart, regardless if they're a true believer that's wandering from the truth or they're not a believer, what's the, what's the action? What's the call to us? Make sure they have their elect card and if not, forget about them, right? They've got a big E, elect. We'll just only focus on them. We don't know the hearts of people. We don't know who, who is true faith or who does not have true faith. So what's the call? Go after anyone who wanders. Yes. Go after them. Seek them. Pursue them. And he uses vivid language of death here, I think, to encourage us, to motivate us, to, to show us the, the, the urgency of their condition, to motivate us to deal with the sin in, in their life, to go after them. I think James knows how we can have a tendency not to care. To be complacent or to be condemning can oscillate between these extremes. We see someone wandering and straying and we might think, oh, that's not my problem. Someone else probably knows them better. That would be a hard conversation. I'll, I'll let someone else go. Or we might go on this other extreme and say, well, they're going to get what they deserve. Good riddance. I didn't really like them anyways. <laughs> they bothered me. Grace means we go after them. Now, there can be a misunderstanding, I think, of grace sometimes in how we use this language of grace or give them grace 
I see this sometimes with parents or, or in uh, marriage counseling with, with relationships with one another. Something, this idea of giving grace means don't say anything. That's what giving grace means. So you give your kid a consequence and they disobey you. You give them grace. You don't give them a consequence. Your spouse sins against you in a really horrific way. You give them grace. You don't confront them. You don't talk about it. You just sweep it under the rug. Can you guys relate to what I'm saying? You guys heard this kind of language used, giving grace. I think that fundamentally misunderstands what grace means. When we give grace, we still would give consequence. We don't turn a blind eye. We don't excuse wrongdoings. Grace is not avoiding or withdrawing. Grace is maintaining a posture and a heart of kindness as you move towards them. Grace is not, (laughs) see you, dude. Have fun. See how this goes. Grace is moving towards. Grace is not talking. is, is kind of being silent about sin. Grace is talking about sin and confronting someone gently and caringly and lovingly in a manner of kindness and compassion. So when your spouse sins against you, giving grace is not shoving the hurt so that it eventually boils over in bitterness and rage. I know that from experience. (laughs) I do that. Giving grace doesn't mean you don't communicate hurts and sins but you do so in a loving way, reflected in the tone of your voice, your body language, your eye contact. So you see someone wandering and straying. You don't say, I'm going to give them grace by not doing anything. You mean, I'm going to go after them in a way that's marked by gentleness yeah. and care. Not shaming, not scolding, not using harsh words, but gently inviting, praying. And I, I think our, our tendency can be to be between these two things, just avoiding or attacking. Yeah. Callousness or condemnation. And some of us might fall more in the avoidant category, like, ooh, hard conversation, ah, scary. So we'll be like, okay, yeah, let's do this. I, I, I've, got, I've got all the reasons ready. I'm, I'm coming with ammo. I've, I'm going to lay it out. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them in their place. For James, we are seeking the restoration of others. We are to go after those who have wandered. And even though our temptation can be both wrongs, to go after in a way that is not loving and kind or to not do anything at all, James calls us to go after those who have wandered. And I think he calls us to do this because he, as he describes himself in the beginning of the book, is a servant of God and the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think about a servant, you're thinking about I'm someone who is doing the master's will and I'm seeking to follow in their footsteps. And what did Jesus do? Why should we seek the restoration of others? Why should we go after those who have wandered? Servants of Jesus, we want to learn from Jesus, follow his example, and do what he did. That's what it means to grow as a Christian. So we we want to restore others because we have been restored. And it's as a way of we are showing our appreciation of our very restoration as we go after others. You guys follow me? Like the way that we demonstrate that we are understanding the grace of God is the way we demonstrate that grace of God to others. Not in a callous, complacent way and not in a critical, condemning, judgmental way. We seek the restoration of others. We go after the strays because that is what Jesus has done for us. And if in your life, this kind of stays like here, like, whoa, cool idea. (laughs) Wow, that's a very cool thought. And it's, what's the word? Intellectual only. Like it it doesn't get here. It doesn't get personal. Like, no, Jesus sought after me. He died for me. He, he, he was put on the cross in my place. He has loved me. He has forgiven me. He has called my name. When it becomes here, you got to do something about it. It's not just like, oh yeah, wow. Jesus died for, Jesus died for my sins. Wow, that's pretty cool. It, if it's in your heart, if you're experiencing that personally, it does something. And we want to pray as a church that the gospel doesn't become this like, 
it just stays up here, it flies above our heads, and it's not coming down into the heart. So we want to sing the gospel, we pray the gospel, and every week we can be tempted to be like, okay, here goes Daniel again at the end of the sermon. He's talking about the gospel. Here we go again. When is he going to get off this? Lord willing, never, 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 never. Oh, I need it to my heart too. I feel my heart is so prone to wander, so prone to forget what God has done for me, so prone to elevate myself and looking down upon others, so prone to not care. My heart is immoved and I need fresh experiences of God's grace and his love for me in the gospel. So I need the gospel proclaimed to me, my heart. I think we need the gospel proclaimed. We need to sing it. We need to pray it into our hearts. So pray that God would make that truth real to your heart, that Christ died for your sins. He he suffered for you. He forgives you. He was raised for you. He gives you his life, his righteousness, his hope. Amen. Jesus is the shepherd with the 100 sheep. When one goes astray, he leaves the 99 to go after the one. Jesus is like the woman who had all these coins and she lost one coin, one coin. And she thought that coin was so valuable that she, she lit the lamp, she swept the house, to find that coin. And when she found that coin, she called her neighbors and her friends together and she said, celebrate with me. I found my lost coin. Jesus tells a series of parables, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and then he tells a parable of the lost son. And there were just two sons. And one son wanted to go do what he wanted. Give me my inheritance now, Father. And he goes and he spends it, the inheritance on prostitutes and a life of self-indulgence and self-centeredness. And he comes to his senses as he's eating amongst the pigs. He's running out of his money. All of his good times are done. He says, let me just go back to my father's house. At least the servants had some better food than this. And the, the son comes back to his father and and Jesus tells the story that the father was, well, all the son was a long way off. He saw him and he felt compassion. And he ran after the son and embraced him. And he threw a party. He said, my son that was dead is now alive. My son that was lost is now found. The lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. This is the heart of the father. He seeks, he pursues, he goes after, he feels compassion, he runs to hug us. Again, you you just think about that's that's a cool parable. It just stays theoretical, but it doesn't get personal and functional. It's not going to move you this way. Say that I was far from God and he ran after me and hugged me. Like, do, you f- you f- do you feel that emotionally? Yeah, come on. Yeah. That, does that do something to your heart? And, and one of the ways that we can show Jesus to each other, help each other believe this truth, is by going after each other. Amen. I mean that in the best way. Like, <laughs> like <laughs> lovingly seeking after, yeah. This is the glorious truth of what we celebrate on Easter. That the king of all creation set aside his crown, took on human flesh, became a servant, died on a cross, died a a sinner's death. And he promised new life and eternal life to all who would believe in this suffering servant, the suffering Messiah. And he gave death the death blow by dying on the cross and on the third day raising from the dead. He was resurrected. And it marks the beginning of a new time. This, this time of resurrection where when we die, our bodies might be put in the ground. They might be thrown into the ocean. They might be burned and ashes scattered. Our bodies and our souls and our spirits are separated. But one day in the resurrection, Body and spirit, body and soul reunited, resurrected in glorification. And Jesus' resurrection is like the proof, the down payment. Because he did that, I don't have to fear death. I know what's coming. 
And when I die, my, my body might be separated from my spirit. I might be in this. What we think about heaven is, is not eternal in the sense it's a temporary place. We're just hanging out with Jesus unless it's soul sense. You see, you see the picture of the babies and the clouds and, you know, those things in diapers. <laughs> those images of heaven. That's not, that's not the end goal. The end goal is new heaven and new earth with Jesus, resurrected bodies. He was resurrected and he gives resurrected life to all who would believe in him. And resurrected life in us, church family, means we pursue those who wander. We seek the restoration of others. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for restoring us. While we were wandering, you called to us. You pursued us. You left the 99. And you, you tell your disciples after these parables, there's, there's more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents. Lord, those who in this room who are your people, there's joy in heaven over our repentance, over our turning to you and walking in the truth and in the light. Or thank you for my brothers and my sisters who have decided to follow Jesus, who have given their faith and trust in him. And I pray that you would help us as your people to be like you, to be more like you, to go after, to pursue, to seek, to restore. Lord, help us to do this with gentleness and with grace and with compassion. Help us to be a people that are not marked by a kind of complacency and apathy and I don't care, it's someone else's problem, they can handle it, I'm going to do my own thing. And Lord, help us not to be critical and condemning and harsh and attacking. Help us to be moving towards in gentleness and in kindness. Lord, thank you for the hope of the resurrection and the foundation of our hope in your resurrection, the, the down payment of the final defeat of all that's wrong in the world. Well, we will sing. The, the realm of Sauron is ended forever. The realm of death, the realm of darkness, the demonic is over forever. The black gate is broken and our king has passed through. He shall dwell among us all the days of our life. We thank you that Easter was when hope in person surprised the whole world by coming forward from the future into the present. So help us to seek to watch out for one another in response to Jesus' pursuit and seeking of us. May we pursue those who have wandered as we seek not to forget about Jesus' pursuit and love for us. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.